Good evening, everybody. It is Steve with Real Progressives. Uh, time is 8.07 Eastern Standard Time, a daylight time, whatever. And uh, I'm going solo tonight. And I'm going to talk to you all about something that um, is, is extremely debilitating for someone such as myself. Um, and I would assume for other truth tellers, if you will. Um, uh, dealing with the difference between what we're going to call ideology versus truth. And ideology um, is a set of beliefs. Maybe it's founded in some truths. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's founded in some beliefs, some ideas. Maybe it's been handed down for generations. Maybe it's based on myths and lore. Whatever it is, it's the foundation of someone's belief system. And an ideology is, is almost something that is impossible uh, to debate because an ideology doesn't require, doesn't require facts necessarily, right? So you think about this. Many people on the left, in particular the left, are very, very fanatically anti-religion. They despise religion at any and all costs. Uh, they take great pride in talking about the fantasy sky daddy and uh, other such things as it pertains to God and so forth. And for those of you who are just joining, thank you very much for coming and greetings to you as well. But we're talking about the difference between ideology and truth. And we're, we're, we're going to take some time to dig into um, how, uh, you know, religion and um, our political ideologies are often one and the same thing, just a different God, right? So what I've noticed and what I think is, is pretty empirical is our desire to make our ideology correct. And in other words, we're not looking for truth. We're looking to justify our present beliefs. And so as you notice, people in the Christian faith, um, some of them are able to uh, take a moment uh, to, uh, you know, think through uh, discrepancies in their biblical faith or their Quran faith or, or their faith in some other thing, they're able to take a look and they're able to say, oh, you know, I'm not sure that I can marry this truth up with this faith-based ideology. And and that incongruency, that, that, that dissonance, that that gap, that chasm between truth and what they believe is a tough bridge to, to cross. So invariably you see ideologues who cannot deviate from their said beliefs and they have to justify them at all costs. So any information that may or may not push them past their comfort zone is rejected on site. It's not considered. It's not evaluated. There is no scientific method deployed. It is simply a matter of, exactly, Russell, it's a matter of apologetics. It's a matter of making the, uh, positing your belief. Um, and, and we see this in many, many political spectrums as well. The left may be every bit as bad as the right in espousing faith-based ideological practices. Perfect example, as many of you all know, uh, there's a gentleman named Richard Wolff. And Richard Wolff is a, uh, he's a professor emeritus uh, up in Massachusetts. Um, but he is considered the, the, the world's foremost socialist economist. Okay, and Richard Wolff, when he talks about economics, talks about it from a standpoint of justifying 
his Marxist-based, socialist-based faith, his ideological faith. It's not empirical truth as to how he views economics. He makes empirical truth mold and warp to match his ideology. Now, for those of you who are MMTers and who have begun digging into modern monetary theory, you know the most difficult aspect of MMT is marrying up the fact that you see truth right in front of you, but your entire life has been spent believing that federal taxes actually pay for things that our government can go broke like your household, etc. That is a faith-based thing. It's not empirical. That's ideology. Okay? And Richard Wolff is an ideological... I, I, I hate using the term economist because, quite frankly, he's not using empirical logic to make his case. He's using ideology. And we can see people like Richard Wolff in the Paul, Ron Paul world of Austrian economists who live in something called praxeology. And what they do is they try to make reality warp to meet their ideological worldview. They're not interested in truth. These are the true sky daddies of the movement, of the left, of the fake left, of the libertarians, of the Democratic Party. Let's talk about that. The Democratic Party. Have you ever sat down and had a conversation with a vote blue sycophant before and tried to explain to them just off the cuff, did you know that Democratic bombs are every bit as lethal as Republican bombs? A friend was asking, can you, can you answer that? The fact of the matter is that they can't talk about it. It, it. it breaks their worldview to accept that a Democratic bomb is every bit as lethal as a Republican bomb. And when you have these conversations, it becomes readily apparent that even presenting truth is going to be met with not just skepticism, but outright anger and rage and resentment. And they will reject it on sight because it violates their ideology. So people have gotten angry with me many times because I am quite frankly brutal and I give no quarter for lies or even errors, okay? Now we all have some place that we come from which is ignorant. We all are born into ignorance. Knowledge comes from learning. So we have to be willing to learn. Learning is an active exercise that requires us to take what things we think we know and learn with things that we can see empirically. This is the science-based approach to life, right? So faith is belief in the unseen, having faith that whatever this is, is going to come to be. It's a hope. And there's nothing wrong with this. I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. I hope for a great many things. I have faith. But I don't confuse my hope and my faith with an empirical knowledge of truth when it comes to things especially like politics and economics. Politics is a very subjective game, would you agree? It comes down to what do you believe? What do you think is important? What do you value more than someone else? And you get 10 people in a room and you give them 100 different questions and you're going to have a ton of different answers. So we're not going to answer it exactly the same way every single time, especially when it comes to opinion. That's why it is so important to delineate between what your opinion is and your ideology is 
and empirical truth. So when I'm talking economics, macroeconomics as a, a school of thought allows for an awful lot of possible policies that many people could disagree or agree with. Policies are largely political, which means that two people who are completely sane and logical and truth-telling people could come up with two completely separate ideas for what a good policy might be based on different criteria. But the one thing you should not be able to do is create your own facts to make your ideas up. And that starts with the basis of modern monetary theory. Modern monetary theory is not a policy prescription. It's not an ideology. In other words, it doesn't require faith to get through it. Modern monetary theory is fact, it's science, it is how it is. Now what you do with that knowledge, that's when we start getting into ideology, like Richard Wolff. Now in an article that was in Truth Dig from this active, uh, active TV uh, something or other um, from Germany, a guy named Zane, uh, did an interview with Richard Wolf, and Richard Wolf clearly stated that he understands that governments are able to quote unquote print money. He's still using that old gold standard nonsense, but they're able to print money to afford wars. That's all he'll say. They're able to print money to afford wars. And then he starts jumping straight into this idea that by giving people money, that things will get inflationary. He's using old logic. The, the logic of the right-wing austerians he's using. And why is it? Is it because Richard Wolf has never been exposed to MMTers? He used to be at UMKC. He's been around all these people. They know, they've talked to him, they've tried to penetrate his thick skullage. It's got nothing to do with a lack of knowing about how this federal financing works. Just like Paul Krugman, Richard Wolf is an ideologue. He's an ideological person. He's not teaching you truth about economics. What he's doing is he's saying, I'm a Marxist, I'm a socialist, and I'm going to bend reality to make my belief in my faith-based system that I've created, I'm going to make it bend and warp to my reality. And that, my friends, to me, is a cancerous way of approaching economics. Because what happens? Now, you've heard me say repeatedly to Democrats, smacking the taste out of their mouths, that when you sit there and talk about your hard-earned tax dollars shouldn't go to bomb countries in the Middle East, your hard-earned tax dollars shouldn't go to Israel, your hard-earned tax dollars shouldn't go to subsidize churches, your hard-earned taxes shouldn't go to do all these different things, right? When you say that, you can expect that the right wing is going to come by with all their bigotry and xenophobia, and they're going to say, I don't want my hard-earned tax dollars going to fund your abortions. I don't want my hard-earned tax dollars going to fund your Obama phone. I don't want my hard-earned tax dollars to go for you to make bad decisions. I don't want to pay for your health care because you led a lifestyle that I don't approve of. And I don't want to pay for it. You see how one lie begets yet again another lie. When your tax dollars go like this, money is spent into the system via congressional decree. It's signed into law. The Fed makes deposits into the Treasury's account. The Treasury writes checks and disperses money. That money is spent by the government exactly one time. 
because its birth is its creation and its death is taxation. So the dollar goes and changes hands however many times it changes. And then just as soon as you think the government's going to redistribute your tax dollars to fund things, guess what it does? It says, no, 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 see, no, no, no. We're deleting you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. You're done. And that's the life cycle of a dollar. So why is it that people continue to hold on to this death grip that their hard-earned tax dollars are paying for things? It's a belief. It's a faith-based thing, just like Social Security. I've paid into Social Security. There's a trust fund. It's got my money in it from 1919, damn it. And you know what? I want my money out. It's my money in there. No. You paid just like a tax. And what do they do? It's a way of keeping money out of circulation by dampening its flow. So what do they do? Just like war bonds pulled money out of the economy, Social Security pulls money out of the economy. Every time a Social Security check is cut, it's a new dollar. Did you know that? This is facts. Believing your hard-earned FICA dollars are waiting there for you in some account, and then all of a sudden you withdraw, and now your FICA dollars are here, is a belief. It's faith. It's a lie. Just like somebody could claim that the Lord Jesus Christ is a lie to you, whereas it's faith to someone else. You're lying through your fucking teeth when you say that your hard-earned tax dollars pay for Israel or pay for somebody's Obama phone at the federal level. Now, at the state level, different story. But that's not really what we're talking about just now. We'll get to that in a minute. We're talking about faith-based economics, faith-based politics, faith-based environmental programs, faith-based, you name it. And every faith-based program is not a Jesus Christ program. Sometimes it's a far-left wackadoo program that has no basis in reality that is a faith-based program. Truth-tellers cannot stomach the nausea that comes from faith-based myth peddlers. As human nature would have it, we like to create stories, and we have done throughout history, for things that go beyond our knowledge. So we say things. We gotta, we gotta wax poetic about the Rothschilds, right? We gotta come up with something to fill in the gap because we just can't understand how neoliberalism has destroyed this country. So rather than talk about the fact that neoliberalism suppressed fiscal spending on the 99% and pushed us all to private debt, which exacerbated the wealth gap. No, we got to talk about how the Rothschilds did this, that, and the other. We got to talk about how Soros did this, that, and the other. We can't face the fact that our government totally ideologically bought into this neoliberalism which pushes the responsibility to survive on the citizens and removes the public policy space of fiscal policy. Guess what we call that? That's a fact, but it's founded on ideology. And that ideology is a faith-based thing yet again, that free markets exist. And that will all thrive in the free market because makers and takers and Ayn Rand and fuck yous and stuff like that. So all of my friends on the left want to send me videos. They want to send me articles, which I appreciate because I really do want to have the opportunity to debunk them before you go sending them around. But when Richard Wolf sits there and tries to talk about deficit spending being only for the war machine, and he kind of puts it out there to make us still yet again scared of this evil system, right? What he is doing inadvertently, because that's just what he does. It's his bend. It's his ideological proclivity to try to make socialism out of nothing. It, he can't envision a world not made by Eugene V. Debs 
He can't imagine a new type of socialism that's bred and bought by state capital, as opposed to somehow or another picking picking ripe dollars off of rich people, thinking that dollars grow on rich people, instead of realizing the government is the issuer of the currency, which he states, he actually states this clearly. But then he chops his own legs out from under his argument instead of helping the 99%. He acts as though we need to freaking find a way to pluck these dollars off the tallest limbs of the tree before we can give people any kind of respite or relief or save lives or anything else. And that is very problematic. Why is that? Because once again, he's making ideological statements in advance of any consideration of truth. He is only out to self-fulfill the prophecy of his own ideological beliefs. Now, some may take exception to this because Richard Wolff has a lot of the same sensibilities that we have. Like, like, like we share so many of the same ideological desires. However, MMTers live in a world called reality, and we defend it viciously because truth is key to a new tomorrow where we can do all these wonderful things and expand beyond our ever wandering imaginations. A new tomorrow so phenomenal that looking backwards would seem shameful if we but had our imaginations open. But instead, in the Richard Wolff mind, it's ideology before truth. So when you send me these articles and you send me these videos and stuff like that, I've gone from being sympathetic to Richard Wolff because I recognize that he's not an enemy per se because he has the right sensibilities. I just realized that his PhD from Yale, notwithstanding, he's absolutely not living in a world that understands federal financing, debt, deficits, and actually serving the people today. He is more enthralled with the fist in the air than he is enthralled with the solutions. And that is deeply troubling. Now, he has many other very, very good ideas. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. But I am telling you this. Don't bring that junk to me as if, see, Steve, I'm debunking what you said. I'm here to tell you Richard Wolf lives, sadly, in an ideological world. And it, I don't have a whole lot of respect for ideologues. I don't have a whole lot of respect for people that tune out truth in pursuit of some ideological bend. You will see it all over our movement with the deep state fanatics. It's like, we can't do anything. We're paralyzed. The Rothschilds, we're all going to die, as Ellis would say. I have no interest in defeatist, non-solutions-based progressives. I have no interest in it whatsoever. I can like you. I can play cards with you. I can even babysit your kids if you want. We can go for a bike ride. Maybe even shoot some basketball together or maybe go bowling. But as far as this political crap and the non-solutions and flailing about and acting outraged and bringing the rage but bringing no solutions, ain't nobody got time for that. Nobody, nobody really trying to make a difference. Because once again, what is the point of having a lot of anger if you're not actually trying to fix the problem? You're just creating chaos. You're just creating noise. You've got to be about the solutions. And you got, in order to even care about having a solution, you kind of got to be pissed to begin with, right? I think the truth is bad enough that I don't require any myths get enraged. When you realize that our country could be spending and giving us health care as a right, forget single payer even, guys. Forget Medicare for all even. 
when we could just make health care a freaking right? Because we got it like that. This is not an ideological thing that I'm saying to you. I'm telling you point blank. Our nation has the resources to do this if it so chose to do it. That's a fact. Now, if the nation wants to do it, that's another story. I see an awful lot of people out there that would gladly let people die, though. And that's based on uh, ideological bullshit because they feel like they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They weren't responsible. They didn't take care of things. So they should die. Just die. Anybody remember wrong, Paul? Anybody remember wrong, Paul? Yes, I'm saying wrong, Paul, because wrong, Paul thought it was just great that if people couldn't afford health care to fucking die. That's an ideological, disgusting perspective. Because I think there's some basic truths. And I think the ability to hoard paper dollars to justify one's existence is not a value that I share. But once again, that's ideological, right? Unless you consider life to matter. Now, is life precious? Is it not? These are esoteric questions. These are existential questions. These are questions of belief. How do you feel? I don't know. How do you feel? Well, I don't know. But I can tell you point blank. Modern monetary theory describes how all currencies work wherever they are, not just in the United States. It tells you specifically how it works, down to the nth. It tells you how state governments work, how they use currency as a currency user. And it tells you how sovereign governments work as a currency issuer. When you say that bank, private banking cartel are making the U.S. dollars and the U.S. government's input it and they're run by banks and they've got no power because of the banks rule and stuff like that. Once again, welcome to your Alex Jones fantasy. Sit down, shut up, eat some popcorn, listen to the grown-ups talk. That is not a fact-based thing. When you say that you believe in fractional reserve system that doesn't exist. Once again, that's an ideological bullshit thing. And it's something that should be smited harshly. When you see people that have beliefs, but choose to ignore facts, this gets us into a lot of dicey areas, doesn't it? Everyone's opinion matters. All voices matter. We should consider everyone's thoughts. Everyone matters. So if I'm sitting here laying on a surgical table and I'm having heart problems and I have gone to a surgeon, a heart surgeon or heart specialist, And I've said, doctor, what should I do? And then all of a sudden, everybody from Facebook comes into the friggin' operating room and says, well, I think you should have some guava, and I think you should drink some green tea, and I think you should take a shot of cocaine because there's nothing like a hit of cocaine tooting up the nose to bring about the old heartbeat. Boom, boom, boom. Nothing like it. I am going to go with science. I'm going to go with empirical stuff. If I've got a blockage and they tell me they need to place a stent, I'm probably going to choose that over kneeling and praying away the blockage. I'm going to. I might pray still too. But I'm going to pick up the shovel, so to speak, and let them roto-rooter the damn blockage out of my carotid. It's just sort of what I'm going to do. It's my style. It's what I'm going to do. So 
when it comes down to economics, oh, trust me, I, honey, I'm home. <laughs> All right. So um, trust me, I can do some Jacko here, man. I'm not going to do my Jack Nicholson right now, but I can even get the eyebrows up and everything. So we'll just leave that one for another time. Maybe a Halloween special. Um, <laughs> so, but the bottom line is, is that we all have these ideas and we have these ideologies and thoughts and there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. Richard Wolff is completely entitled to believe in socialism as I believe in my own flavor of socialism, but my flavor of socialism, I admit, hand up in the air, is an ideological thing. What is not ideological, however, is the rudiments, the mechanics of federal financing of currency analysis, of the way dollars flow through the system. That right there is not ideological. And when people lie about it, I feel it's my duty to give them a chance, give them one chance, I tell them to explain it to them. The minute I feel ideology creeping in, I, 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 I look at them, I wave at them, I crawl up onto the top rope, put my spandex on and my friggin mask my wrestling mask and i go nacho and i drop the elbow of truth on him because truth really does matter once we get the foundation of truth then we can work on what to do with that and take a whole slew of ideological approaches based on truth not based on fantasy and fiction and crazy conspiracies that make someone slightly less than okay, slightly less than valuable. I find conspiracy theories when they are founded in easily debunked truths. When I find that these people still hold on for dear life to these lies, my respect level for them goes from, let's say right here, down to right here. Can you see where my hand is? No, believe me, it's pretty freaking low. I have no respect for people that peddle lies. None. Like to me, here's Steve's ethos. A false accusation, a lie, is there's like literally nothing worse than that to me. I mean, I can think of very few things worse than someone who lies. Like, like it is so counter to what I value because it's impossible to make good decisions. It's impossible to fix the real problems before you when it's all founded in something that's a lie. So if you believe that the Rothschilds own America, how are you going to fix that? You know my jokes. I say, hey, you're going to put a bar of soap on the floor, maybe coat it with some baby oil so when they step into their marble, you know, wraparound shower that they slip and fall? Or are you going to get them to drop some, uh, some you know, arsenic into their morning Earl Grey? I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, seriously. It's just stupid. And this is why I say let's focus on solutions. Let's look at what reality is. What is the underlying truth? So one guy in particular today that used to follow real progressives a long time ago, um, but we Savat kicked him out of here because his every comment was written in all caps. And that's kind of like one of those things that, you know, if you guys are from the D.C. area, you remember old Sports Talk 980? There was a guy who go, banned from the Tony Kornheiser show. And that's what we did. It was like, banned! Get your friggin' all caps and go over there to wherever you go to type lunacy stuff. You know, go go read Veterans Today or whatever crazy thing you're going to do about lizard people and other stuff with David Ickes. Go do your thing, man. Get your swerve on it. It just ain't going to be here. Well, this guy sat there in an all caps tirade, broke down somebody who is an mmt -er, who is a real progressive, who was sharing about the truths of how we can fund our revolution. It's not that that's the only thing we can do with this truth. We can fund wars too, just like Richard Wolff says. 
And we could fund an awful lot of really, really bad things if we don't elect the right people. If they don't make good choices, we can do some really awful things. Imagine that. So it's kind of like this, right? I used a knife earlier today when I was cutting up onions to make a little omelet. I was making an omelet. Just hungry, decided he'd make, some, make an omelet. Now, I could have taken that knife. And I could have walked up and gone, Ugh, and shoved it up in somebody's sternum, and there would have been a really bad thing, right? But no, I wasn't using it for bad. I was using it to dice the freaking onions for my omelet, right? Good. Good food. Yum, yum. Well, that's the same thing with deficit spending, right? We can spend all kinds of money on the F-35. We can spend all kinds of money on lunacy, chasing down a freaking crazy, crazy, crazy conspiracy over in the Middle East where we go ahead and annihilate a bunch of people, drop a few bombs, kill off a few dictators, and along the way blow up a few wedding parties. Now we could do that with deficit spending too. But guess what else? And this is going to blow you away. I know you're going to freak. We could also provide everyone with single-payer health care. And we could also provide a federal job guarantee for every person in the country and eradicate involuntary unemployment and stop a shit ton of xenophobia by making sure that people aren't looking over there at the people coming in from Mexico as stealing their precious freaking non-skilled labor jobs. So we could do so many things. But instead, this guy decided he was going to hold on to the idea that no, we got to tax the rich at 95% because damn it, Ike said it. So that's the way we got to do it. We like Ike. So there you go. That's the deal. But the reality is, is that if you believe our planet is dying, again, there's science out there that would suggest we're coming up on an environmental crisis, an event horizon, if you will. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to live. I want my kids to live. I don't want a mass extinction. Yeah, crazy shit like that. I don't want that more than I want to soak the rich first. So it's not like, well, damn it, I don't care if the fucking planet blows up or not. God damn it. I am soaking the rich. And until we soak the rich, we can't solve the climate problem. We can't fix the environment. God damn it. Until we soak the rich because money grows on rich people. That is just pure, unadulterated idiocy. Anybody that believes that we have to fight a tax war of any variety, any variety, to pay for things is an idiot. Is a fucking idiot. That's right. You're an idiot. All jokes aside, they're an idiot. So as we've walked through this so many times, I want to have a planet for us to actually, hey, Varun, I know exactly what I'm talking about, Bata. So let's get you out of here, brother, since you're just filling up the page with idiocy, okay? I'm going to help you out of here, brother. I'm going to help you right on out the door. In any event, the bottom line is, is that taxation doesn't fund spending at the federal level. Our country is monetarily sovereign, full stop. So let's get Varun out of here because we have no reason to have Varun around. Let's help him out the door real quickly. And then after we're done with getting Varun, oh, good deal. Thank you, guys. After we get Varun gone, uh, my hope is, is that what we can also do is we can get back to the truth and realize that as long as we live in myth land, as long as we live in an idea that has nothing to do with reality, we can't solve the problems that we have. If you believe we have to tax before we spend, you don't know what you're talking about. If you believe that a government that creates its own currency, that created its own currency, in fact, so that it could create a state of unemployment, 
making you need its dollar. Oh, you didn't like that one. That's truth. The government created currency and then taxed in it. By taxing in the dollar, it allows the U.S. government to provision itself. Hey, we need roads. We need this. We need that. How do I get my people to actually do this? Here, here's a piece of paper. Take your piece of paper and shove it in the fire. It doesn't mean anything. Ah, but you got to pay your taxes in that piece of paper. If you don't pay your taxes in that piece of paper, you go to jail and we take your house. How's that? Oh, well, shit, I better get some of those pieces of paper, don't I? So that is how a fiat currency works and has always worked and will always work. Full stop, period, end of story. Otherwise, you end up with worthless coupons that you can make wallpaper out of. It's the tax that provides the need for the dollar. It's the thing that provides the reason the dollar maintains its value. Not some shiny object you dug up from the ground or you panned out in San Francisco back in the old days with your old paint jalopy. Okay, it is the tax dollar. It's taxation. And that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. It's so simple, a caveman could do it. But yet ideology, like Varan, blocks people from being able to understand how this works. So, uh, so what role do corporations and banks play in this? They play absolutely no role in this, that the uh, Congress doesn't allow them to play in this. So the bottom line is, think about this, right? Our Congress, by the Constitution, okay, Article 1, Section 8, says that Congress is the lone person that can actually authorize spending. Congress, by Constitution, is the lone entity able to spend new dollars into existence. So Congress created a creature from Jekyll Isle to handle the changes between all the private banks and stuff back in the day. And now it's just a means of, it's a scorekeeper right in the center. It's the hub that allows all these transactions to take place. At the end of the day, banks get you and I into private debt. You and I cannot create our own dollars. So what we need to do is we need to demand that our Congress serves us, that our Congress represents us, and our Congress spends on us. What do I mean by spending? Well, think about this. How many kids go to school for a college degree where there are no jobs waiting for them, even these business degrees, even these other degrees that you think would be so great, they're having trouble finding work. And then when they do, their student loans are so high that they're already in a position where they've got to live with mom and dad no matter what. I mean, that's, that's a serious problem. So what our Congress could do is forgive student loans. It could authorize the spending to mark up those accounts or mark down those accounts, if you will, and literally eradicate student loan debt. It could do that. It could do it a host of different ways. One of them, however, is not quantitative easing, unfortunately. What Congress could also do is it could pass a bill that made Medicare for all available to us with a very, very simple IT solution. It could go immediately into the code base. And instead of saying at whatever age it currently says, it could flip the beginning age to zero. So from cradle, and that could do infinity, from cradle to grave, all Americans are covered for Medicare for all. It could do that right now. And it would be, the, the IT solution would be so inexpensive. Now the problem is that for a short period of time until we got enough professionals to be able to actually handle the influx of people, you might see a surge in costs. You might see some delays while they're ramping this up. And you know 
the conservatives of the world say, see, socialized medicine, it doesn't work. No, we've got an extra million jobs we need to fill, doofus. So guess what, people? Go get your friggin' degrees and your certifications and whatnot in the medical field so that you can meet the demand. That's the deal. It's not that the money, printing money, suddenly created inflation or something like that. What it did was it created demand, and we don't have the supply right now to meet that demand. So there might be some delays. There might be some price uh, hikes, et cetera, for a temporary period of time. But our government could choose to pay those changes in costs and not pass it on to the citizens. It could do that. Without any problem at all, it could do that. It could be completely transparent. You would never see it. But do you think our government will do that? No. Why do you think that? Because too many of us believe, we have a belief that our dollars are spent on this stuff. We have a belief that the government is run like a household checkbook. And because of that belief has no basis in reality at all, zero base in reality. This is truth that we can do this. However, ideology says, well, if I don't have the money to pay for all the things I want, why should the federal government be able to pay for the things it wants? Well, I don't have it. My hard earned tax dollars. So going full circle, back to Tricky Dick, Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf, really, really nice guy, probably. Really, really great sensibilities. Probably a fantastic dancer. I bet he even has a good singing voice. I don't know. I've never heard it. I'm taking it on faith. But when it comes to his description of debt, deficits, etc., He's talking ideology. He's not talking truth. So with that, I'm Steve Grumbine from Real Progressives. Stick around. John Lancelot will be joining us momentarily. I hope to see you all soon. Have a great day, everyone.